The transition from the proof of concept to the modern methods of fMRI took a short eight years, um, from 1990 to 1998. And the, in 1990, the technique was introduced um, by Ogawa and in rats, and it took a year until the same feat was accomplished in humans. <clears throat> a year after that, there was the first PET study of memory showing activation in the hippocampus. And it wasn't until 1996 that the first uh, traditional block design study of memory using fMRI was accomplished by Chantal Stern and Bruce Rosen. And uh, in 1998 saw a dual publication in Science of a uh, study of memory using uh, event-related fMRI, which has become the standard of the field, in the field. And we have our own Jim Brewer um, on the West Coast and Wagner. In these early studies, um, <clears throat> research teams tended to be collaborations between psychologists, neurologists, and neuroscientists on one hand who knew about the study of memory um, and the nature of memory, and physicists, radiologists, engineers on the other hand who knew how to measure the signal, how to tweak the machines, how to run the machines. Um, most scanning took place on clinical scour. Clinical scanners, um, which were relatively low strength, magnets in off hours. So you did your research in the middle of the night or on the weekend and you hope that there was no automobile accident that would uh, eject you from your experiment. Nowadays, memory research can be done independently by psychologists, neuro, uh, neuroscientists, neurologists, and this is a tribute to the um, uh, development of more automated protocols by the um, engineers, um, physicists, for people like me trained in psychology to carry out their free research without having any type of background. Um, and, and most of the scanning takes place on dedicated research scanners like the ones we have at the Cat Center, and uh, the magnetic strengths have become um, three Tesla or even higher now. So for the rest of my talk, I'm going to tell you about the progress that's been made since these early days until now. And the first thing I'm going to talk about is uh, how to acquire scans with the field terminal lobe. The challenge in acquiring scans with the field terminal lobe is that the medial, the medial terminal lobe is located, located near bone and sinuses, and these are two things that cause signal loss. <clears throat> On the left is a horizontal section of a standard T1 anatomical scan, and what I've done is invert the colors so that skull shows up as white hippocampus is here, and in this, in this slide it's surrounded by bone on three sides. Um, and on the right is just a skull, and uh, the mule terminal would be nestled down and into this bony area here. Um, and so the challenge is how do you get functional signal given all this bone and the bone and the sinuses surrounding the area. <clears throat> Early on, researchers knew to avoid acquiring scans in the axial plane. And these images show what voxels would look like um, in the coronal plane if the um, scans were acquired in either the axial plane on the left or the coronal plane on the right. And acquiring scans in the axial plane means that your longest dimension is in the inferior superior direction. And so your longest voxel dimension, um, in this case, is in this direction. And what happens is these lower voxels have both brain and bone in them. And uh, this causes signal loss or signal dropout. So you wouldn't really get any functional data from these voxels if you acquired um, the scans in the, in the axial. In contrast, when, when uh, acquisition happens in the coronal plane, your in-plane resolution is much better. Your longest dimension <clears throat> is in the, is in the um, anterior posterior direction. And so you have a, less, uh, a smaller likelihood of having bone and brain in the same voxel, and you're more likely to get um, viable signal in the, in the slow part of the brain. <clears throat> Another advance was to tilt the coronal slices perpendicular to the longitudinal axis of the hippocampus. So on this sagittal section, the hippocampus is here, 
diverging um, gray matter in the hippocampus with this adjacent white matter. Next, I'll discuss the challenges in identifying the memory signal itself. And early on in the study of memory, finding hippocampal activity was actually the exception and not the rule. So in those earlier studies that I mentioned, um, most of the activity was found in parahippocampal gyrus, not in the hippocampus itself. And um, it sounds like a very simple um, approach to study something. So memory, why not just present familiar items for which there should be a memory, and novel items where there should be no memory, and compare activity for those two conditions. <clears throat> it turns out, if you actually carry out this experiment, you may or may not find a chemical activity. And in this example here, uh, novel pictures were shown. And so novel uh, pictures are on the left, and familiar pictures are on the right. And in this graph here, what I'm showing is brain activity in the entire hippocampus um, versus rest. Viewing novel pictures versus rest or viewing familiar pictures uh, versus rest. Um, there's two things I want you to notice here. Once it, one is that neither condition is different from baseline, nor are the conditions different from each other. So um, first, I'm going to talk about the issue of baseline. Rest sounds like a period of mental quietude, but it's actually a terrible condition if you want to study memory. And what's happening is in these structures, rest is actually a time of a lot of activity. And so it's not a good idea to use it as a baseline. When other types of baseline conditions are used, activity is actually higher for these tasks compared to rest. So in the study by Kickstart and Mary Squire from 2001, they presented uh, a number of different possible baselines. So you have here, um, the red is a moving fixation cross. Um, is an arrow pointing to the left or pointing to the right? Um, the ability to detect the letter X in the right way visual mask. And um, deciding if a digit was odd or even. <clears throat> so if we were just to choose the, the odd even baseline, for example, um, condition as the true baseline and compare the novel pictures and the familiar pictures for that, we actually get a fairly different picture. What we see here now is that the, the memory signals are now measurable, so we have something to measure. The next question is, um, why is activity the same for familiar items, which there should, should be a memory component, and novel items, where there should be no memory? The reason that the hippocampus is active for both of these conditions is that it's active when people are remembering the familiar picture, but also when they're encoding into memory the novel picture. Both of these things are happening um, in the scanner. In this case, um, the activity level is the same. The condition was kind of the um, expected with clinical activity, but the hippocampus is always on. It's always encoding what's going on. So one of the ideas is to just abandon altogether um, activity associated with the novel items and just focus on activity associated with the familiar items. So in this example, participants study words during a pre-scanning uh, study session. And then when they're in the scanner, they're showing those words again, and they decide uh, if the words are old or new. And what happens is some of the words are remembered, and other, some of the words are forgotten. You also intermix new words um, to keep people on their toes as they're making the memory decision, but you don't use that data in the memory contrast. <clears throat> what you find when you carry this out, this task out, is that hippocampal activity is higher when, uh, for words that are remembered than words that are forgotten. And here it's bilateral activity uh, in hippocampus. And other similar approaches have been used as well, and I'll touch a little bit on those ones later in the talk. Next, I'm going to discuss some advancements that have happened in the methodology, and these can apply to all the imaging studies, but they've been quite helpful in the study of memory because um, a lot of those studies have been focused on one region, the hippocampus, and um, finding if the signal is present or absent in the hippocampus, or whether memory modulates uh, activity there. And so, what I'm going to talk about now is the alignment of brain regions across individuals. On the top, what you can see is a coronal, an axial, and a sagittal scan from one subject. And when scans are averaged across 15, subject, 15 subjects, the resulting image looks blurry. And this is because the anatomy is variable, and you end up um, averaging some of the white matter and some of the gray matter, and so you get kind of a fuzzy looking gray like this. And so, what happens um, when you average uh, these data together, or you warp, warp the data to a common space? And then you simply average um, voxel by voxel across all 15 subjects. <clears throat> um, the problem that, ha that can arise when, with this method is that um, someone's white matter, like I said, can be averaged 
um, it's called ROIM, uh, stands for Region of Interest Alignment with Advanced Normalization Tools. And that was developed by Craig Stark by UC Irvine and uh, Brian Evans, who's at home. And the way the technique works is it uses manual tracing of region of interest along with the grayscale information that's in the brain to um, warp the images together, not necessarily just average them to And um, it aligns the brains quite well. In fact, 
there's a special issue of the Journal of Experimental Psychology being planned right now that is devoted to um, this broader view of the hippocampus that's been revealed by imaging studies. Thank you. 
So the last 10 years have seen a lot of progress from the first traditional block designs with huge boxes to um, now percolated uh, designs with, with smaller boxes, possibly even looking into the subfields of the campus. So I'm optimistic that the next 10 years will also be as fruitful.